Hello and thanks once again for taking the time to download and listen to a podcast on Celtic Underground. Dot net. I'm Harry Brady and what a bumper show we've got in line for you today. Bring me sunshine in your smile. Bring me laughter all the while. In this world where we be super duper bonfire night. Special edition of the Celtic Underground podcast is jam packed full this week. We have the return of the Tales from the Celtic Wiki. It's for Patrick Gallagher, who has a Celtic Graves event at St Kentigan Cemetery in Balmore Road at noon on Saturday, the 5th of November. Jim Craig and Tom Boyd will be there. Also, there'll be a blessing by Father White of St Mary's Church. So there's that. We also have a fantastic guest in the form of Hugh McDonald, formerly of the Herald, and occasionally of the Herald, occasionally of uh, Sports Sound, various other places. You'll get him online at Red Blaze, and you'll also hear how passionate he is for Celtic. Also, don't forget, if you're going to the game on Saturday, which I'm sure everybody is, because isn't it bloody marvellous being a Celtic supporter at the moment? We have the Green Brigade's annual food bank collection on Saturday. There's various collections. If you go online, um, go on Twitter, various things, you'll be able to see, I think uh, John Paul Taylor has tweeted stuff, that their, their collections are really at the Gallagate's uh, Holywell Street entrance, Janefield Street entrance on the Celtic Way, and at the bus park, looking for things like cereal, pasta, rice, pasta sauce, etc. After the game on Saturday, we then have Sunday the 6th of November, which many of you will be aware, most of you will be aware, is a special date for Celtic because it's the date that the club was formed. So, Celtic FC Foundation, the Christmas Appeal, which I mentioned to you in the last couple of podcasts, it's building its momentum and... Anybody listening to this can participate on this Sunday, the 6th of November, the anniversary of the club's formation. And what they're asking you to do is asking members of the Celtic family to fast for the day in honour of our charitable heritage and donate what you would have spent on food that day. They are suggesting £5 to the Christmas appeal. So if you're interested in that, you can use the hashtag FoundingFathersFast that's hashtag Founding Fathers Fast on Twitter. Uh, and the Celtic FC Foundation Twitter feed is foundation, at Foundation CFC. Let them know that you're getting involved. They'll retweet your stuff. And then, of course, to donate, you can go online to the Celtic FC Foundation. So that's CelticFCFoundation.com. That's go online to CelticFCFoundation.com. Or you can text CELT07. That is C. E-L-T-07. Don't know if this needs to be the case, but the written down instructions that I can see, that's all in capitals. So CELT, C-E-L-T-07, followed by the amount you want to donate. They're suggesting £5, but don't limit it to £5 if you can afford more. And don't think you need to go to £5 if you can afford less. And if you text that to 770, so that's 70070, also, if you go online to the Celtic FC Foundation website, you will be able to get the latest Celtic FC Foundation newsletter for November, which gives you a bit more information about what the aims of the foundation are in relation to the health, equality, learning and poverty, the HELP, an acronym that they use. Um, there is a bit an introduction from uh, Tony Hamilton, there's a wee bit about Donna Marie, and there is also some insight into some of the work that they do. Uh, many of you may remember me talking about being down in London when they um, launched an event down in Tower Hamlets. And there's an update on um, how that is going also. So, enough from me. All of that fantastic Celtic chat. If you want your new music on the podcast, if you want to contribute anything to the podcast, if you'd like to maybe even ask about being a guest in the podcast, if you'd like to do an article for the site, whatever you'd like to do, if you want to communicate with Celtic Underground, 
then if you go to podcasts at celticunderground.net just stick an email podcast at celticunderground.net it will be read it will be responded to if it's your new music it will be played anyway this is me Harry Brady with him Hugh McDonald followed by him Tales from the Celtic Wiki as the sun from up above Bring me fun, bring me sunshine Bring me love, sweet love Bring me fun, bring me sunshine Bring me love So I'm now joined by Hugh McDonald So Hugh, pleasure to have you in the Celtic Underground uh, podcast Pleasure to be here, at my age, a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're both starting to be men of a certain age, the toilet's just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, first up, before we get anybody on the podcast, we have to prove their Celtic credentials. Yeah. Um, so before we get into the meat and bones of this, I have to find out, what was your first Celtic game, and who was your first Celtic hero? I've watched Celtic in seven different decades. I've just worked out. So my first Celtic game would be in the late 1950s. I was taken there by my grandfather, who was a Celtic fan, and it was Celtic v. Idrid. I'd be three or four at the time. And I can't remember much about it. Uh, I've tried to look back and, 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 and see uh, what game it could be, but there's various ones that could, could tally. But I was obviously uh, really smitten by it. Um, and he didn't take me very often to games because he had, he had a multitude of grandchildren, so he couldn't be seen to just take one, mm-hmm. you know, and then he, he was a working man. Um, he worked in Whitbreads, he was a gang on Whitbreads, if possible. Um, so, uh, I mean, more after that, go to Shelton Juniors with my other granddad, who right. lived in Shelton. Uh, but as soon as I became you know, of the age to go to football myself. It was mm-hmm. Celtic Park, I always went to, and then I, I graduated, we moved to Busby, and I graduated to be a member of the Busby and Eagle, some supporters bus. Right. And I um, was there, was a member there really until my journalistic career intensified to such an extent that I was working nights all the time. I was, my history in journalism is I, I was an editor, really, a, a sub-editor. And so I had to work nights, so right. then I uh, uh, could only get to games on Saturdays and not midweek games, really. You talk about, just, you mentioned there about your granddad being a working man, because I think a lot of people won't sort of realise, part of the reason for the three o'clock kickoff is because so many people worked on, on Saturday, Saturday at 12 o'clock, you know? yeah. Aye, very much so, and, 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 and the Saturday wasn't a day off, and, um, and, the, 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 and that wasn't for him either. Uh, but the football for my, both my grandfathers was um, almost kind of religious experience and that it was what their big focus on. My grandfather was, the other grandfather, uh, the Shelton fan, he, his attitude to Shelton was, was maybe softer than my granddad's attitude to Celtic. He saw Shelton as a sort of social thing as well because the club, mm-hmm. you could have a pint and all that. <clears throat> his mother granddad was a teetotal and he was a very very strong Celtic fan and he was in with the tradition of Celtic yeah. um, a strong Irish background um, and um, knowing what the club meant in terms of culture and significance to a section mm-hmm. of Glasgow um, uh, in particular but Scotland uh, uh, yeah so um, um, I mean it's another thing I mean talk about here or my <clears throat> I think when I was getting old, I'd be 12 when Celtic won the European Cup, so your heroes are generally fun. I think everybody's hero would be Jimmy Johnson, mm-hmm. but you would just presume that. I mean, if somebody asked who your favourite player was at that time, you wouldn't have said Jimmy Johnson, because everybody would just presume that Jimmy would he, yeah, he yeah. Had a, sort of, a second player. Mine was Bobby Murdoch, and, right. and remained that way uh, all through Bobby's uh, Celtic career. I loved Bobby Murdoch, and uh, I had uh, I, I met him and, 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 and uh, I did a big piece on Bobby for the Opus Celtic Opus mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and I met Davy He because I thought Davy He would be a good guy to, to talk about Bobby mm-hmm. and uh, Davy was played right back at, behind uh, Bobby and also succeeded Bobby in many ways into the Celtic midfield and then yeah. 
I think Davy he was a, a player of real substance, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I said to Davy, you know, um, you know, a bit, but of course I said you you played with Bobby, and you know you were you succeeded them, and Davy Davy reacted, but you know real horror, you know, you know, I said, no, 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 I'm not Bobby Murdoch's comments, you know, not by a million miles. Right. Very humble guy, David, mm-hmm. very honest guy, and he wasn't trying to be, you know, elicit a reply from me. Say, oh, David, you're great. He, he was, he said, oh no, you've got, it. you know, he said, Murdoch was, you know, world class, one of the greatest ever. You know, he, he don't. I just wasn't in that league. Never, not, he never pretended to be in that league, and you know, gave little vignettes of how good Murdoch was, and that, you know, if you were right back, for example, he says Murdoch would demand the ball from you in impossible positions. That you wouldn't have given the ball to anybody else and couldn't mm-hmm. drive a hospital pass or a pass that would put the player under pressure. And he says, Bobby would see that you were under pressure and he didn't mind what pressure he was under, he would take the ball. Mm-hmm. He says, so oh, that was, you know, his teammates adored him, not just for his ability to, to play the ball. He was very tough as well. He shot, he scored a lot yeah. of goals. But that ability to help another teammate out of trouble... He says Murdoch was always available for, you know, even the poor pass. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was very open about Bobby, which pleased me because I, I love Bobby. Mm-hmm. I, mean, yeah. I mean, I say that type of player, uh, is sometimes, you know, so much of football now is consumed in the television. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's the type of player that you only really get a full understanding of how good they are when you watch them in real life because on television you don't see some of the other bits that are play. Yeah, the... the, the but Murdoch had both because Murdoch, if you saw him on the telly, I mean, another thing I had to do for the Opus, uh, which was interesting, was to watch the a certain European Cup final. You might remember it, right? 1967, Celtic got a result and they wanted me to do a match report on it. It was a kind of flawed concept but uh, because one of the tricks of doing a match report is not knowing how the game's going to yeah. end. So but anyway, I, I did this and, and I watched, I remember that the... the, the when I consumed it at first, I was 12 years of age and watching it in a gym in St. Joe's uh, in, in Busby. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I watched it in this DVD and I was amazed at how good Murdoch was. I wasn't too amazed about how good Murdoch was in that day because I'd watched him for years after that, but I thought. But one thing that was really amazing was the amount of times he was sending the ball off his left foot. Mm-hmm. And he asked the late and great Glenn Gibbons, um, former journalist for the Mail and the Scotsman, um, asked him, I said, strange, I said, just watch DVD of the cup final and, 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 and Bobby sent a lot of balls off his left. He said, yeah, it's because he was playing with Dicky, right ankle, his ankle, his right ankle was done. Mm-hmm. And he was injured and he, he couldn't really hit the ball off his right ankle, right ankle. So what you've got there is a player dominating a European Cup final against a, um, an Inter Milan midfield mm-hmm. of Peerless midfield. Yeah. He's dominating the midfield with his best foot camied. You know, so he's playing that. So that gives you an indication of how good Murdoch was. But just to touch on that, because Celtic are now starting the process of building to the 50th anniversary mm-hmm. of that game. And about a year ago, I saw the stats. Mm-hmm. And we've all seen it, every Celtic fan. I mean, I wasn't alive at the time. I was born three years later. But every Celtic fan has, has seen the game. Uh, just because you, you mention it and saw the stats and saw a half hour highlights package it really must you forget it really must be one of the most one sided European Cup finals no, so it's not absolutely not. annihilated yeah I've even got, I've got a sort of PhD in that Cup final because you know with guys like Pat Woods who of course is a great Celtic historian who's mm-hmm. actually got a, a cash in the Scottish Football Museum of mm-hmm. stuff relating to that. I've actually been through those big pallets of stuff for the 67 and then it was. One of the interesting things about it as well, it's, it's somewhat forgotten as well, is that European football was on a cusp then. Mm-hmm. You remember the year before um, uh, England had won uh, the World Cup, yeah. with a, a very pragmatic and almost wingless team. And as you know in football, People follow the success thing, you know. You know the, all the buzzwords, yes. pressing and pressing high, yeah. and uh, people. Yeah, but it's four, two, three, one. one and and yeah, it's everybody follows that. So what Celtic did was made attacking football not only sexy again, but made it practical again. People mm-hmm. say, "Oh, this is the way you go." And if you read the great Dutch masters, 
uh, like Rhinus Michaels or Johan Cruyff, uh, amongst others, you will see the significance that had in total football. I mean, that was crucial to the whole development mm-hmm. of the of the Dutch model of total football. They saw what we meant because what you got to remember is that if you watch, just watch the goals, and uh, if you just have to watch the goals, but uh, people of, of older age would say, "Well, what's so strange about the goals?" Two things that are strange about both goals is the position of the full backs, mm-hmm. right? Gable is actually inside the area when he cuts the ball back from Murdoch to, to, to Sir Chalmers. Craig is almost level with 18 yard line when he's playing that. Now, that is the way modern fullbacks play now. Yeah. But that was never the way fullbacks played. Fullback, you know, everything is. Look at Carlos Alberto's 1970 goal. Um, look at, you know, any overlapping goal now. But that's not the way it was before 67. Fullbacks sat mm-hmm. in a very, they wouldn't, I mean, don't go beyond half the line. Yeah. So it was crucial to the whole. I mean, Stephen changed world football. It just changed it. Uh, I mean, it's just like, uh, if you, if, if you, uh, I mean, I'm lucky enough in, in football to talk to uh, great names in football through mm-hmm. my job. If you talk to somebody like Ali Ferguson, who would, who'd have a claim to be the best manager ever. Yeah. You know, it's a subjective thing. But he would have a strong claim to it. If you talk to him about scene, I mean, he would, he would laugh in your face if you were trying to put him in the same class as Steen. Seriously. Right. He wouldn't, he would, he would, he would laugh in your face. He would say, and Ali has a sense of how, I mean, Ali's got a good sense of what he's done and what he's achieved. Yeah. And quite rightly so. He's not a man who would be, you know, a, 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 a sort of, uh, downplay any achievement. Yeah. He's, he's a realistic guy, but don't. I mean, try and put him in the same class as Steen, and he'll, he'll snort. He'll just he'll just laugh at you. In the way Steen was miles ahead of his time. And you mentioned actually a player there uh, a wee moment ago that led us into this conversation, which illustrates from for people like me. So my first Celtic game was in August '74. Mm-hmm. What we missed out on because following the list of lines were he McCarry. Doug Leash, Connolly, we actually had the for me the, the the core of what could have been something else. Yeah, but they didn't. But it went around Connolly, whatever mm-hmm. you know, for, for various reasons. McCarry left, Doug Leash left, Kay left. They all left within three four years. That's the most significant sea change in Celtic history, and it has resonance up until the moment. It's a con- huge contemporary resonance now. Because if you listen to you listen to um, Brendan saying uh, after the Brendan Rodgers after the result in Michigan Land Bank, which was a heartening result, mm-hmm. saying hey we can build on this and we can build a team, part of me as a an old pessimist says, well, 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 can we? Because if you look at if you look at Celtic over even the last five six years, if they were going into the Champions League uh, in match uh, on Wednesday with a team of say Foster. Well, we'll play it four two three one as everybody yeah. plays. It say Foster, Lustig, Simonovic, uh, Van Dijk, Tierney, um, Song, and Wanyama Holden, uh, Sinclair, uh, Rogic, um, McGeady or Ledley, and Dumbelli up front. You would go, and you've got Brown, Griffiths, whoever on, on the bench. Yeah. But God, that's a strong team. And that's a difficulty for some, mm-hmm. and that was difficult for some not buying good players because, by and large, everybody moans about the the dads, but by and large, the, the bought good yeah. players. The difficulty is retaining them. And if you go back to '67, for example, it is inarguable that every Lisbon Lion played their best football for Celtic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was sold when Celtic yeah. were done with. Them. That's a blunt truth. There was no Lisbon Lion that went on and, and became a star mm-hmm. after Celtic. Bobby Murdoch went on and, and helped Graeme Souness become a star at Middlesbrough and others did okay in other clubs. But under the registration system at the time, under the way the Celtic model was done at the time, it didn't sell. And the big thing then was... From 1970, after they lost the, the cup final, if you look at the team in 1970, the beat Leeds home and away, had a residue of Lisbon lines and had the start mm-hmm. of the Connellys, the Douglishes, McGrains, McCarries coming through. 
I just said, God, this is a, this is, this is a mm-hmm. dream. And it proved to be, they got to semi-finals of European Cup, yeah. etc. But it changed. Suddenly, players were for sale. Players went. The business model changed. And a huge problem <laughs> for Celtic at the moment um, is that they're trapped by geography. Absolutely trapped by it. You've got this huge club, which is this wonderful infrastructure where everybody from Chavi to Messi to the Munchen Gladbach players I saw uh, their pre-match interviews this week were talking about the greatest stadium and the greatest atmosphere they've ever played in. They've got this diaspora of support that they can get you, um, this support that can serve up 50 odd thousand for a, a pre-Christmas game against Ross County. But they can't keep players in the modern reality, mm-hmm. in the modern world. They just can't. It's, 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 it, it, it must be, it must be so frustrating uh, for 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 uh, the Celtic board. Uh, and you know, I know they're wriggling and, and trying to push. But if you imagine, I mean, I always laugh when people say, "How would Celtic do in, in England?" They'd be they'd be top four because mm-hmm. they'd be, everything in football is done. Everything in football. Okay, you have a bit of Leicester who already yeah. won season, but I think football's basically with your budget. And Celtic with that budget and with that sustainable support mm-hmm. behind it and the infrastructure, they're going to be a top four club. Well, day, day, day one, somebody turns around to Celtic and says you get an extra £100 million. Mm-hmm. Pounds yeah. to say. Yeah. And then you, can even, you can say, well, actually, we're going to go on a £200 million pound spending spree because yeah. we're going to borrow our second year money. We're going to want to make an impact right away. Okay. And then all the players that you bring in, your Dembele's, your Van Dykes, your Fosters, your Wani Hammers, your Songs. There's no reason for them to go anywhere. Two things about what you say there. I was saying this to, um, I was actually away from Munchen Gladbach game um, and said this to guys from Manchester. Uh, I was talking about the difference in the English Premiership and I was talking about when, when Celtic had scored the winner in the League Cup mm. and the first thing that Dembele and Griffiths did was, despite the mm. attitude in Scottish football, the first thing they did was run to the fans mm. to get in the fans. And one of the things I noticed when the big name players score in the English Premiership is they run to the camera mm. and then have some coordinated celebration, mm. which patently is a premeditated thing, premeditated thing about them and their mates. Mm-hmm. It's insular about mm-hmm. them and their mates. Whereas for me, the, the big thing that we've managed to maintain, and I would if we ever did manage to leave this environment to hate us to lose this, is that there's still a connection between the club and the supporters. Mm. That even a club like Manchester City, when it went through its worst year, seemed to have that connection, look like they've largely lost that mm. connection between the people on the park mm. and the people off it. And I'm not saying it's like it was when you know players were getting a bus in, but there still seems to be a connection. Yeah, I'd agree with that. But I think it goes back to that more than the club thing that, that the, you know, and it goes back to my history as a silly fan, probably your history as well. I mean, I, I always used to watch, you know, I worked in England a lot, going down to football and that, and, and no English sports desk and things like that. And the conversation will turn up how, how did you become, you know, you talk to Joe Bloggs or the Mirror, how did you become a Chelsea fan? I watched the Chelsea Cup final in 1970 with my dad, and I just thought, oh, that's my team or whatever. That doesn't really happen. It certainly didn't happen to me. I, I mean, I made no conscious decision to, to support Celtic. You just were. You just were a Celtic yeah. fan. You were born into being a Celtic fan. There was no... And my father wasn't interested in football at all, Brian, which is really, for a man of his... He didn't hate it. Really. He just didn't look, just wasn't interested. Same with me. <laughs> uh, but, but, but the football thing was... It was automatic, like, you know... Celtic fan. It's interesting. Yeah, see when you hear someone on something like Five Live saying, yeah. "I've been a Spurs fan for twenty years." I think, well, I've been a Celtic fan since well, I've been conscious of football existing because you just are. Uh, well, it is, and it's, it's a funny like a family thing as well. That it's just generally presumed. I mean, if I go to a family wedding in a wider family, and by a lot of my brother-in-laws and things like support Rangers and all that, but I'm talking about this stuff. Blood ties would be. Um, you know, all the conversation from cousins and all that would be, you know, cousins that you maybe haven't seen since the last wedding would be over and it'd be, Celtic would be the reference point, you know, what's happening at Parkhead and what do you think of this one or things like that. So, very much 
just for me it was just like I can't honestly remember well the reason I can't remember not being a Celtic fan is I never bought it I mean it was never the day we you became he became one yeah you just wear uh, and again I recently was doing something interacting with some people about the Celtic Foundation because mm. I do stuff with that and they were talking about the history of Celtic mm. and they said tell us a bit about the history of Celtic so of course you talk about why the club was founded when it was founded and St Mary's mm. November 87 first game May 88 and Brother Walford mm. and what, all the reasons for it mm-hmm. and the guy said to me um, you, you do know this is what everything that makes Celtic unique mm. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm a Spurs fan. And if somebody asked me or stopped outside Arsenal's ground or anywhere and mm-hmm. asked people about the history of their club, they would tell them about trophies they've won, mm-hmm. big games they've won. He said, you're the 10th person I've spoken to today at Celtic that I've mentioned the history. And it takes five minutes before they mention a game. No. Well, I think that's so integral. Um, to, I mean, I, I, I've loved the way that the foundation is really stretching and, 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 and become more visible not only the support but the outside world I thought it was terrific that the, um, the, they had the, the badge on against um, Mention Gladbach and it does make the club um, something special and the great thing about it is you know Brian if you're ever around the foundation you, you get to know little personal stories about people that have helped and, and things that they're doing and, and, and it's stunning I mean it's it's something that every Celtic fan, I believe, should really embrace, and and because it's it is, it's just wonderful the work they do. Mm-hmm. You know, with every creed, colour, whatever they, they don't care. It's about it's about health, it's about education, it's about learning, it's about alleviating poverty. It's just a fantastically pure thing, um, and uh, I'm always better for being round to anybody from Celtic Foundation. Uh, it, it is, and we've had Tony Hamilton on here as well talking about, about stuff. And well, to stick an advert in, in the middle of it, we're in the middle of the Celtic Foundation's Christmas appeal. The bucket collection will be 17th of December, I think it is. Um, so uh, that's that. But to get back to also, you talked about the building the team. During the Munchen Gladback game, I texted a couple of mates saying, we need, if we get two midfielders mm. of the standard of Simonovic and Dembele, mm. we are a last 16 team next yeah. season. My only concern is, do we lose <laughs> Simonovic and Dembele yeah. and bring in the midfield? If, if we can, I appreciate where we are. We only attack Dembele because he knows this is a stepping stone to go in somewhere else. I wouldn't like to to be used as stepping stone phraseology. But I accept that's where we are. Mm. So he only comes here because he's going to go somewhere else. But if we can just keep this core for at least next season mm-hmm. to be able to add to it, I think we can do something. What yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I mean, the great thing about Champions League is it's approaching 30 mil. Now, under the previous model, um, what Celtic had to do every year to sell a player, that was just, that's the model. You sold yeah. your Foster, your Yama, your Song, your Van Dyke. He sold one every yeah. year. Now, the indications might be that um, certainly I think Brendan Rodgers has more pull and more influence at Celtic than any manager since Martin O'Neill. Mm-hmm. And that uh, I think it'd be, you know, he would have uh, influence, strong influence with Peter Lowell and influence. Um, uh, further up the chain uh, with Desmond uh, uh, the owner uh, Dermot Desmond the owner so is the plan next year and only they will know this and they might say something about it at the AGM to, to say see next year we don't go through the model of selling a player mm-hmm. we lie fallow for a year yeah. because we've got the 28 million from the Champions League if we add to the squad we've got a good chance of getting Another 28 million from the Champions League, maybe even a chance of being competitive in a better group. So that'll be a business decision to be made. Um, that is a sense of frustration for um, people like myself, and that um, I, I laugh at people who say to, you know, a certain generation who say, um, oh, beating Barcelona Parkhead is the best result Celtic have ever had in Europe. And you go, we won the sodden thing. 
Now is a good result. Beating Leeds, who everybody thought was the but best home, team. Home and away was a hit result, you know. Beating Brighton Fiorentina, the Italian champions, 3 0 in the park here, was a decent result. I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, you could go through us. I mean, I suppose people forget we won the European Cup quarter of a century before Barcelona did. Mm-hmm. Quarter of a century. We won it before. Any German club won it. Seven, I think seven years before a German club won it, Celtic won it. Mm-hmm. The only teams that won the European Cup before Celtic came from Portugal, Spain, and Italy. Well, that's it. Yeah. So this is the significance of this club. Uh, so the frustration for me is that as a young man, it's quite strange to say now, but we would go into the European Cup the way Celtic would go into the, Europe, the Scottish Cup now. We'd go into the European Cup thinking we could win it. Not certain we would win it, but mm-hmm. thinking we could win it. And, and results bear it out, you know, final in 70, couple of semi-finals, losing very narrowly to a Milan team that went on and absolutely won the final 4-1. They just went on and, ran, you know, that was the final, the quarter-final yeah. between Celtic and, and, and AC was the final. So, it's a, so you made a bit of luck, 3-4, the mm-hmm. European Cup team without uh, over it. Uh, so now to be seeing, I mean, now to be seeing, like, you know, to be competitive in the Champions League, it, it's all about money, of course. It's mm-hmm. all about the budget. Um, uh, and that's, I think the big challenge for Celtic will be uh, at a boardroom level and at a, uh, a level of where do Celtic play? Mm-hmm. That's going to be crucial to what happens to Celtic um, in the short term, even five to ten years. My I know this sounds premature to be saying it. One of my concerns is that we are so good and Rangers can't do the cheating they did to keep up with mm-hmm. this last time. I actually do have a concern that Brendan gets bored mm-hmm. in 18 months, two years' time. Well, I think the, the, one of the things you've got to look at Brendan Rodgers quite coolly is that to say to himself, I mean, he's a Celtic supporter, so he's bought into that. I mean, he's, I don't think there's anything unauthentic about his affection for the club. Uh, but he'll be wanting like every ambitious man to be test himself against the best wits mm-hmm. in, 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 in the world and the Champions League will give him that I mean I think he would have immensely enjoyed the Manchester City game for example yeah. and I think he'd be immensely satisfied by uh, Tuesday's game particularly after the run around at Celtic Park mm-hmm. you know changing the whole dynamic of that I think would have satisfied him and, and would have pleased him to be his team uh, did that. But the, to me, the, the inescapable fact is that, that if at one time uh, down the line a major club comes in from this got Champions League real pretensions of winning it, mm-hmm. it's really difficult to see Brendan turn around and say, well, I don't want to go to a team that, that can win the whole thing. You know, I, I really I find that. I mean, the guy's an ambitious guy. Um, a guy who's a football manager who <clears throat> goes out of his way to learn Spanish and Italian. Mm-hmm. He shows me he's a guy with ambitions beyond these yeah. shores, never mind yeah. anything else. The thing about it is, of course, is that the, 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 um, a change in the, in, the, in, the, in the playing arrangements, whether it be a new league or anything like that, would colour them differently. Mm-hmm. I mean, if he was sitting at Celtic Park in two years' time, suddenly in, in EPL or whatever, and saying, Wait a minute, I've got a budget here that can keep the Dumbellies and the Rodgicks, and I can, I can buy a Joe Allen or I come in. You know, you look at the the Joe Allen thing to, to men of my age shows the classic thing. You know, when Stoke, you know, yeah. I mean, for example, when the internet was 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 buzzing with Joe Allen coming to Celtic, I mean, you couldn't get me off the floor for laughing. You know, I mean, this, the fear alone never made the wages. You just say, well, that's Celtic's Champions League money away. Uh huh. When a guy may have a pulled hamstring after two weeks. I mean, come on. Uh, it, it's when people keep mentioning, and, and maybe I'm wrong, and, and, he, and he might well come, mention McCarthy. Mm-hmm. Different circumstances because he can't get a game at the moment. Mm-hmm. He's still on 72 grand a week at Everton mm-hmm. and requires to take a £1.5 million pay cut to become equal top paid player at Celtic. Yep. And then the fee on top of that. And then the fee on top of that. No, it's, 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 it's very, very difficult for the board. It really is. I mean, you, you're paying against the bottom club in England to get £100 million, and then if they get relegated, they get £84 million on top of that. 
That's me the kick in the bum off two hundred million pounds for getting relegated. It would take Celtic almost its entire history <laughs> to earn that out of Scottish uh, football league. Well, this season we could win the treble, mm. play Champions League football, and only get three quarters of the way towards the bottom team in the English Premiership gets just on the TV. So, so it's really difficult. Really difficult. Equally, five years is an interesting timeline because that's when everything changes for TV contracts because the existing contract runs out and the new one first European football is being negotiated mm-hmm. just now so the, the next one runs out in five years time mm-hmm. and I think the way football is changing now you've got two um, authorities that are very weak UEFA and FIFA are probably fatally undermined mm-hmm. um, the clubs are already just Shoveling their muscles, getting their elbows in. You can see that with the revamp of the Champions League uh, qualification. Chinese money is pouring in. There's three billion pounds worth of Chinese money already in Europe. Um, they'll be looking to pour even more money in. I think it's a very what businessmen like yourself I would call fluid situation. Mm-hmm. I think I wouldn't be a guy that ruled anything in or out. And I think there's opportunities for teams. Um, that have a brand to maybe shove themselves forward in the pecking order. I think, for example, and people poo-poo this, but I think, for example, the atmosphere at Celtic in Champions League nights is a very great selling point for Celtic because they can go to EF and go, you want to lose this? This is football. The amount of positive publicity, one of the guys who's on our podcast, Mark Cooper, based in Argentina, it was the main story in Argentina. Mm was our game against Man City that night and talking about the atmosphere. And I actually, that night, was sitting there thinking, people are looking at tweaking the Champions League because it's not quite right. Mm. This is everything that, that they would want exactly. in the Champions League, two competitive teams going toe-to-toe. And the place shaking. And the place shaking. It's just a fantastic game, fantastic atmosphere. And I said the best way to unleash that would be to get rid of seat, to get rid of seating, to get rid of everything they want, and have group stage games where it is Real Madrid against Manchester United or Arsenal or in the group stages. They will never enact the changes that would give them the competition they want. No, that's the idea they want to me. Because it's all about buy loading it for money, yeah. uh, you know, after Christmas. But I mean, uh, I think, but I think there's a lot of things that are going to happen in football. Uh, quite suddenly as regards television deals and influx of new money from China I, I remember being told that Dermot had persuaded Mark Manil to come to Celtic partly by telling Martin that within five years Celtic would not be playing in Scotland mm-hmm. and that Dermot believed that mm-hmm. at the time I do find it significant that any loosening of the Celtic wage structure and use of an overdraft facility can only happen on the sanctioning of Dermot Desmond, and that's obviously what we've done in the summer to bring in yeah. to pay Brendan over a million pounds more than Ronnie Dyler was getting, and to wage to raise the pay mm-hmm. uh, ceiling for Dembele and Sinclair. I don't know when it's either just he got bored, <laughs> he re- re-engaged with Celtic, or he maybe has the same sensation that he had at the time that Mark Neil came in about. It might not happen, but there's a possibility of change. Maybe a bit of both, and it might be the fact uh, that, that you know there's a great celebrated story that he wasn't overly enamoured with the um, uh, celebrations uh, at the, 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 the cup semi final when Rangers won that, um, and who knows what tips a businessman of his. I think you get poop, you get scorned whenever you see. Um, uh, you know, there's a, a possibility of leagues being changed and all that. There's significant things being said about it. If you read recent interviews from people from the sixth floor in Hamden, mm-hmm. at one time it was de rigueur to say this can't happen. Now they're welcoming cross league. Well, we have a cross league exactly. competition right now. Exactly. Exactly. Last they're, welcoming they're welcoming it. Now they're, uh, so that has changed, and that has changed for a reason as well. You have, as I said before, you have two world bodies who are not in a position to um, deny things anymore. They're not in a position to veto things because the cops are saying, 
I'm going to new models. This is a couple of reminders. Why do we need you again? Mm-hmm. This goes back to the Kerry Packerisation yeah. of, of football for maybe the younger listeners. That was Kerry Packer just formed his own cricket competition. Oh, um, do you know, I often look at the, I'm a cricket fan, so I often look at Kerry Packer and continually think that's always on the horizon if the sort don't get what they want. Absolutely on the horizon. And then when you've got to look at the guys from the guys that are coming in and already had, you know, the big guy in China, Dalian, has come in and already had conversations with La Liga who are very concerned about what's happening, particularly in the EPL. They're mm-hmm. hugely concerned about what's happening. Barcelona and Real Madrid did hugely concerned about what's happening in the EPL. But when they can get out of bed, getting back to the Stoke. Exactly. When they can get out of bed by Stoke. Mainly, yeah. you, they, they, I mean, they are all branded, as you know, as multi, you know, billionaire companies, and they're all branded. That's why they're paying Gareth Bale so much to tie him down. Why Neymar and, and Messi will get huge deals to tie them down is, is it goes beyond football results. It goes beyond branding. This is this is our, our player, and they, if they fear, and they did fear that a Manchester United could take a Bale away from them. They're saying to themselves, wait a wee minute, we'll have to have a look at the revenue structures here. We'll have to have a look at the television money here. We'll have to have a look at what you're getting out of Champions League. And when people come in from outside, particularly like, again, going back to the Chinese, they come in, with, they say, they don't come and say, oh, we can't do that because it's UEFA. They go, wait a minute, what's this UEFA? Mm-hmm. What do they do for you? What have they done for you lately? Well, well, they they uh, organise all come. Well, okay, I'll get a board then and organise Oh, but they've got all the referees. Hey, we'll get our own referees. We'll just see the referees come and join us and we'll pay you whatever. That's exactly what Kerry Packer did. Exactly what Kerry Packer did. And when people, people like maybe, you know, who are in deeply entrenched football cultures think that things can't change, people coming in who are involved in a cultural and economic revolution in China, yeah. they go, well, why can't you? Just get rid of them and get another board. I'll get you a referee. You know, Joe Blondes. Bring you and your mates. What are you getting for your effort? Well, we'll give you double that. It's, it's, and you, you only need one of the FAs to break ranks and go, we'll side with these guys. Right. Uh-huh. And another one, it happens in any walk of life, people then become fearful that if they're not part of it, they'll the lose out. So, so they'll lose out. They'll be, if, you don't, if you don't join the bandwagon, this is why the, the comments from the La Liga chief executive who confirmed that he was in talks with the Chinese, is so significant because he's saying to UEFA and FIFA, not only am I in talks with these guys, but I'm willing to say it to the FT. I'm willing to tell the Financial Times that we're unhappy. That this is a viable plan. This is a plan that can work. What are you going to tell me mother here? What are you telling me mother here? There's a quivering because they know. This, is what, this could all just implode. Mm-hmm. And as you say, particularly with the <coughs> leadership, and, 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 and yeah, you've got no credibility in UEFA mm-hmm. anymore. You've got a vacuum at the club, at the top, and then clubs start looking at you know what cut are we getting out of this? You know what cut goes to the governing body? Mm-hmm. You know what gets skimmed off the top mm-hmm. for administration and for rights and things like that before it gets divvied up, and that concentrates the mind wonderfully, Brian. Yeah. So, normally we start with the person's career and then lead to this at the end of the conversation. So, um, well, let's get back. How did you get into journalism? So, you went to St. Joseph's and Busby. Um, what led you from there to being a journal- in journalism? I went to become a journalist because I didn't want to become a doctor. Uh, I'd been accepted uh, to go and study uh, uh, to become or to go to university uh, anyway, and, 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 and I was thinking about being a doctor. And I suddenly realised I didn't want to do that. And I, with about three or four weeks to go before going to uni, because uh, I went there, I was going to maybe go and become a lawyer as well. I, I was on a real flux, I didn't know what I was wanting to do. I saw an advert in the paper about become a journalist, and I was a great reader and I liked writing. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I went and I got that, and I got that job, and it was a great job. Did that go down well at home? Not particularly well, no, because um, I would have been the first one of my family to go to uni. Mm-hmm. First one of generations yep. of family to go to uni. Um, uh, so, no, not really. Um, um, but uh, 
it worked too well for me because it was something I loved. Uh, I became a sub-editor and then I became a chief sub-editor, which is in charge of, <coughs> excuse me, deciding where and what was in the paper. And uh, I was also a literary editor. And then at one time uh, um, in the Herald, they moved me to be um, a deputy sports editor. Mm-hmm. Um, and from deputy sports editor, Graham Spears left uh, the Herald and they said to me, well, I'd been doing a call, mm-hmm. and doing a bit of writing as deputy sports editor, and obviously doing a bit of writing as literary editor when I was literary editor. And they quite liked my writing, and they said, well, why don't you have a go as being chief sports writer? I was about 50 at the time, mm-hmm. so it was a big sea change for me. Um, but it was fantastic and loved it. You, your story that makes me feel better, because one of the things about yourself was, to use a often used phrase at the moment, you were off the radar mm. from my perspective in terms of the sports journalism mm. in Scotland and all of a sudden I became aware of you mm. and aware of people talking about you as being somebody substantial within the industry and I was thinking, I, I don't know what paper it was at because I must have missed mm-hmm. him first. but obviously that explains mm-hmm. uh, to someone like me. So how... How came it came late? Uh, yeah. Uh, was it something you'd always have wanted to have done? Do you know, it's really strange. Yeah, I probably would have. But one of the things was, in my in my uh, younger years, I was very, very ambitious. And to get to the top of journalism, which I wanted to be, I wanted to be an editor and all that, you had to go through the production line. So that's why I, I concentrated on being a chief sub-editor. And then I realised in my 30s that I didn't want to be that. I got kind of burned out, frankly. Right. Yeah, I really got burned out. I got exhausted emotionally, psychologically, physically by being a chief sub-editor and decided to take a sideways step into whatever else I could do, which was the making of me. Uh, uh, and always sort of harboured a love of sport and sports writing, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would be reading really good sports writing, mostly from America in those days. Yeah. You know, the Red Smiths, Damon Runyon's, uh, Ring Lardner's, um Sports Illustrated stuff, um, Michael Vanney, of course, yeah. John Rafferty, Ian Archer, who's obviously mm-hmm. in the Herald with me. I'd be reading that stuff quite, um, and Glenn Gibbons, and I'd be reading all that kind of stuff and, and quite closely. I was, I was very interested in sport and football, and uh, there was some intellectual arrogance against that at the time, particularly on the Herald, you know. But do you, do you know, think, I mean, being a bit younger, but my perception is that the reason you were picking American authors is there was allowed to be that crossover. No, 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 I remember when I was chief sub in the Herald the, 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 in the early days, this was the seventies. The sports editor would get minimal time in conference, mm-hmm. whereas now, of course, sport is seen as central to the newspaper. You know, any yeah. it's a big selling point. I mean, it's still, Herald's gone back to that tabloid, for example. Uh, the crossover was such, and if you think about in America when they were doing very big trials, like maybe the Dutch Schultz trial or the or, or the Lindbergh baby trial, mm-hmm. uh, were, which were two huge cases in America, the sports desks would be cleared to do the colour in that. Right. They would be the best writers, would be the sports writers. Mm-hmm. They'd be sent to write the colour, and Damon Runyon would be sent out, Ring Larner, and, and, and people like that would be sent out to uh, the sticks to do those court cases mm-hmm. and to do that stuff. I mean... Uh, so America's got a fine tradition of that and I always thought soap sport was important I always thought because it was important to me still is I read a lot of sports books now I would always have a sports book on the go now mm-hmm. I mean it wouldn't be my solitary reading but it would be something I would have a, I mean I would always be reading a sports book and of course sports books have got fabulously better yeah. in, 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 in my lifetime yeah. than in fact, that's how I started sports writing because I, I said to uh, the sports editor, the, the Herald, 20 odd years ago, I would like to do a column on sports books. Now, sports books were suddenly becoming mm-hmm. quite good, and that's how I got writing. I mean, certainly, from my uh, perception, uh, again, the sort of tipping point in relation to football books was Nick Hornby's. Yeah. The, I, the only downside for me is it then made everybody think. I could have written that book and so everybody thought they could become a, 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 a book writer. Yeah, although Hornby's book, I always think, is 
it's, it's, I like Nick Hornbrain. I always think it's a bit of a cheat because he writes as if he's a football obsessor and there's a couple of bits of little mistakes in it that we show he is. And, and again, again, like maybe most sports books, it's not really about football either. It's about a child and divorce, really. But anyway, the book that tipped it completely for me it was only a game by Eamon Dunphy, mm-hmm. which I maintain to this day is the best football book I've ever written <clears throat> because it took the gloss, it took you behind the scenes what it was like to be a professional footballer. Not at Manchester United, but Dunphy was at Manchester, but at Millwall. Mm-hmm. Um, and then going back to my uh, great hero, there's a wonderful section in it where uh, Dunphy's playing for Millwall against Middlesbrough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's up against Bobby mm-hmm. Murdoch. And there's a couple of paragraphs in that that just warm the soul. Uh, but I think that's the best football book ever. So you then get into the Herald um how did you find, because obviously if you've been an editor, sub-editor, etc., how did you find that transition to being the guy out there as the main focal point of the Herald's writing? Um, I didn't even look at it really like that, Brian, because I was so, I mean, instead of looking out, I was so bothered about looking inwards and, and how to do this job. Right. There's really strange things about football reporting. There's like, um, you have to learn how to actually do the physicality of it. Mm-hmm. Right, um, like mix zones, you know, people will not understand this so much, like, you know, like doing a running match report and getting that sent right away on addition, uh, which is the most stressful thing imaginable. You know, you've got to, I mean, because you just can't see he kicked the ball, he could, you've got to write a sort of lucid piece, mm-hmm. and you've got to send, and people say to me, well, when did you send that? You send that on the whistle. Mm-hmm. Any, do you write a chunk at half time? I write, yeah, I know, I don't, everybody's got their own way of doing that. I would do nothing but watch the game for the first half. Just watch the game, get a sense of take notes. As soon as the half time whistle would go, I would try and get something down, try and get some theme down. Mm-hmm. And then it's almost like kind of you have to sort of riff off that theme as the match progresses. But of course, not 45 minutes. You're typing and watching. So mm-hmm. it's, it's very, very, it's a real craft to do that it's, uh, and some people can do it um, much better than others and a lot of people can do it much better than me uh, but then there's the sort of stuff of how to interact with you know the physical stuff like going down to press conference you know the daily papers get this guy the even then they go into Mexico and you get this and you get that and all that was completely new to me interaction with managers and players was new to me um Building relationships. Building relationships, relationships and again, the relationships thing is very, very difficult because at one point and you've built a relationship and then suddenly you destroy it because of what you've said or mm-hmm. got to say. It's hugely difficult that um, um, because you've got to see things about people and about players and, and managers that are, can be really brutal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have done that and then you fall out with them uh, kind of um, irrevocably um, so uh, that's difficult it's, it, it, it's not the um, it's a great job uh, but in it's football element because I did other sports mm-hmm. it's football element is the most difficult of all sports to cover for a variety of reasons but it's the most difficult sport to cover I mean I've been fortunate this season to be to a couple of press conferences and the point you mentioned there I have seen guys literally walking into the room up down from the Celtic press box into the press room which is just a no, yeah. two minute walk one minute walk holding their laptop in a hand still typing as they walk in the door oh yeah sitting down typing listening to the quotes typing away around the corner typing you'll, you'll see like if you go to an airport what they've done one of the things now is they fly you back immediately after games if you're on the Celtic charter and you can see guys actually typing, put their, their computer down to go through the radar, uh, the uh, security, security, and pick it up. And there's actually been times where we've been on planes, you know, and, and stewardesses or cabin crew telling me, you know, you've got to, you've got to put that away or take it off. Because what happens, of course, is you do your match, but then you go and get a player. And as soon as you've got the player, they want you on the minibus to go straight to the bag drop, to go straight to the, mm-hmm. the plane. It's, 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 it's hectic, it's frantic stuff, frantic stuff. So other sports, yeah. I've, I've certainly heard you on Radio Scotland mm. when Andy Murray's been on in the mm. in the tennis. I do find it an interesting thing actually that 
Tree Andy Murray, there's no tennis legacy in, in Scotland at all yet. I've heard both yourself and Hugh Keevans is in tennis experts on, on Radio Scotland at, at, at times. I, I'd be very hesitant about being a tennis expert. I'll tell you what happened to me, Brian, was that when I became, before I, when I became deputy sports editor of the mm-hmm. world, I said I have to brush up on a lot of sports. One of the sports I have to brush up on is professional. I knew nothing about tennis, and people will tell you I still don't, uh, and they wouldn't be too wide of the mark. But I knew with, with this kid at 12, 13, it was coming through, mm-hmm. it was coming through strong. I didn't realise it was going to be. Yeah. But he won it, as you know, he won at 15, he won a, 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 a junior open in the US Open. So we knew he was going to be significant. Probably top 20, you mm-hmm. know, we take that, top 20 players. So you had to become, um, you know, cognizant about tennis. So I, I kind of boned up in it then. And then when he, I became chief sports writer, I read a tennis book every week. Any tennis book. Mm-hmm. I'd go to the library and I'd get even instruction books out on tennis or I'd get biographies or get anything at all. Um, just anything at all on tennis. I'd just read tennis, 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 tennis. So I had some kind of backstory or hinterland about tennis so that I went to a tennis competition. I would have some history of it. And it's quite funny because I remember the first US Open I went to the, I met a guy called Chris Cleary who's a tennis writer for the New York Times and he's a very he played tennis at a good level I think he was a club professional but he, he knows his tennis and Chris used to laugh at me because I would I would when I was sitting in the stands with him I would ask him the most basic questions mm-hmm. um, and I said I'd rather be appear stupid in front of Chris Cleary than write something and appear stupid in front yeah. of because you know, I wouldn't you know I, I, I would always want to write or know as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But, you know, why is Nadal in, 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 in not playing as well against Djokovic in here in, on a hard court as he would on clay? Mm-hmm. Now, that's an obvious question now for him because I know a bit more about tennis and it's all to do with height and getting top spin on his mm-hmm. forehand. But it had to be explained to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm quite okay. I'll ask that question. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you should as a journalist. Well, the only daft question is one you don't ask. It's the uh-huh. famous, it's the famous three. So, what other sports are you into? I'm into all sports. The only sports I could say that you know leave me cold are motorsports. Mm-hmm. Right, when engine in it would leave me pretty. Um, I've got this, I've got this saying that all journalists know that I will say that's not sport, that's transport. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm into. I can get, can get really excited about most sports. I mean, I, I remember I did the Olympics and I jumped from sport to sport and there wasn't a sport that bored me. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, you would be at the, you'd be at the velodrome for the track cycling and then mm-hmm. you move to the swimming and then you move to the rowing. What else did I do? I did everything. Um, I was all over the show of athletics. Um, went to tennis for Andy. I mean, I just loved that. I mean, I'm sports. No, I love sports. Would you say that Andy Murray's Scotland's best ever sportsman? I would say that Andy Murray is Great Britain's best ever sportsman. Right. Uh, I've got three criteria in, in the future. Because you wouldn't class Jackie Stewart then, because he's a Scotland's best ever van driver. Uh, well, <laughs> well, one of the criteria I would say that the knocks Jackie Stewart is there's an argument that Jackie Stewart's not the best Scottish motor racing driver. Right. You could argue that the Jim Clark. Jim Clark, better. yeah. So it's an argument that I think you've got to be. Pe- I think it's got to be a global sport. Mm hmm. I think you've got to be successful in a time when of good pedigree, of good success, you know, where there's a good yeah. opposition. You know, like Larry Holmes can get to... Aye. Um, yeah. Or, I mean, you've got to be a phenomenon. You've got to be the one guy in your sport in that country that has beaten every, that, that's peerless. Now, Murray may fall down a bit in that with, with Fred Perry, but it was a different era. What Murray has done has been, and he might yet be world number one at a time when Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal are playing. Who are the? Th- if you put five greatest players of all time, those three would have to be in the top five. Mm-hmm. Definitely, they just would. Nadal, for example, is the greatest play player ever. Full stop. Federer has won the most Grand Slams ever. Full stop. Djokovic is chasing them. So they're three of the best. And Murray has a flavour. 
going on I think, um, for me, I think I think for me Labour and, and Borg would be in the top five maybe Sampras pushing mm-hmm. for me Sampras never had the same peers that you're talking about no uh, uh, but he was so invincible John Mike no for his excitement no he would just slip down maybe into the top ten uh, but uh, Murray what is that and the thing about Murray as well is like I always say Murray's like having you know a Scottish tennis player of that class mm-hmm. is like the best downhill skier in the world coming from Sydney or the best surfer coming from Siberia mm-hmm. I mean it's just it's just phenomenal it's just extraordinary where he's come from you know no history of it no I mean I know his mother played etc etc and his granddad played but there's no tennis culture in no, Scotland none at yeah. all yeah. none at all and and um, and some of this, the bank story of Murray as well you know that people forget that he's got a bipartite patella which means his kneecap is smashed in half which really means he shouldn't really be any good at any sport because mm-hmm. he's in constant pain from a, a smashed kneecap Put yourself. I mean, it's just a phenomenal story, mm-hmm. uh, and I also happen to, you know, I've followed him for a long time, and I admire and respect him. I think he's a good guy. So you talked about uh, clay quotes there. That reminded me to ask a question I was going to ask earlier. Your Twitter handle. Red Blaze. Yeah, do you want to explain to younger listeners? Younger listeners. I've never had the luxury of asking something drastically for people. People in the world laugh about me because my, I don't know, there'll be very few that will listen to this that will read my Saturday column, which is Demented Witterings, but it usually contains a sort of uh, mandatory reference to a mole master <laughs> and to uh, Blaze Pitches. And Blaze Pitches were ash pitches, which... Uh, it was the initiation rite of Scottish schoolboys of a certain age. They used to see the Maasai warriors initiation rite to get into um, to get into becoming a male in the Maasai tribe was to be circumcised without an anaesthetic. Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. I would have chosen that over playing in a you know a beller mine on a Saturday morning on a red blazed pitch with a mold master. That would make a circumcision without anaesthetic look like luxury, you know. Uh, so uh, do you know? I still have a recollection of playing because I used to be a goalkeeper. Well, playing in goals in Port Glasgow on a red blazed pitch with shorts on uh, and half my leg missing uh-huh. on down your side and letting in a goal because somebody hit the shot and I hadn't touched the ball for about 20 minutes uh-huh. and it was February uh-huh. and it was sleeping uh-huh. and the reason the ball went in the back of the net is because I couldn't feel my hands uh-huh. oh there was that I mean it was like uh, oh I mean I mean the, 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 the great thing was he didn't play in black or red ash he played in Colt Bridge in Whiflet Colt Bridge or something like that where I played as well on on, on uh, parts, grass parts that were like the song, you know, you were sort of people we were losing people in puddles and things like that. You had to count the players back in, you know, go back out and look for the left wing and I haven't seen them for about three days. You went to St. Joseph's, I went to OLM and the thing that always got me about OLM was uh, down anybody who knows it, it's now um Homewood House uh-huh. um, and it was attached to the convent uh-huh. and in front of the convent they had a big grass area uh-huh. and they had the black ash uh-huh. football pitch. They were both the same size, and as a child, I never understood why we had to play football in the ash part, where there's a big grass area of identical size was left unattended. Uh, so it's build up the soul, right? <laughs> yes. build the soul, and an initiation right into being a man. You were never a man until you did iodine and a wire brush and you were not thigh. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So um, covering that off. You're now, you said you're semi-retirement. Obviously, a lot of journalists in the last wee while of more experienced ilk, you mentioned Graham Spears as well, have gone freelance mm-hmm. or whatever. How do you see the newspaper industry going in the next few years? Difficult to say. I mean, it's challenging. That's the term new businessmen use, isn't it? Challenging. <laughs> I think... You're not allowed to use negative words. You're not allowed to say it's shite. Right? <laughs> the, 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 the big difficulty for newspapers is that they, they got the internet wrong. Old idiots like us got into them, right? We say, I said about 15 years ago, and the internet came in, we should just ignore it. And everybody burst out laughing at this. I said, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do anything about it. Don't get away. Don't create a website. Don't do anything. Newspapers will die, but they'll die slower. Mm-hmm. They'll die with your readership. But if you've got a hard copy and they can't do anything, 
but buy your hard copy. Well, a dedicated amount of people will do that. Yeah. There will always be a constituency for them. But what other business would have done what newspapers did? Here's what newspapers did. Newspapers decided that instead of putting 20 pence in the meter, right, you could just lap, go into your laptop and press a button and your meter filled up. Mm-hmm. So you didn't even have to go outside to go and get a newspaper in this rainy, windy day. You just went on your laptop and pressed the button and you got all the news. And the lack of paywalls and, and, and giving away stuff for nothing was a laughable concept and, it, and it's, it, it's now so out there that it can't be called back. Mm-hmm. You can't, it's gone. Yeah, it's that horse is so far bolted, you can't see it. So newspapers then have got to create got to create a culture where you can only get their niche stuff by paying for it. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be difficult. For some papers, for example, I think the best paper for me now, the best paper of the week is the Financial Times on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. That would be for me the best paper in the world. It's FD and it's a, so I pay my four quid for three pounds sixty yeah. for that. Because um, it's a niche. Now, the Financial Times has got a, 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 a real possibility of making the internet work because people like yourself know that you can only access the information you really want mm-hmm. from the FT. Yeah. So it's a really good, strong niche. So, what is a niche for other people? Other people are going to have to attend. And them. they got in early with the principle of you had to pay for it. Exactly. You have to pay for it. Just got, this is important stuff, so you have to pay for it. Yeah. Uh, and a. Uh, what papers will have to do now is, is establish that core, that niche, which is going to be significantly less than the revenue from circulation. Advertising is going to be significantly less. So they'll have to concentrate their resources more specifically on stuff and lose other stuff, but hope that the stuff that they can, that they, that they concentrate on allures readers, mm-hmm. seduces readers. In Scotland, I would suggest that if I was doing it in Scotland, I would have a paper that continued very heavily just in sport and politics because they're the two things that will sell in Scotland at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so I would have a, I would almost, my entire budget, I would almost ignore news stories, for example, mm-hmm. like car crashes and, you know, fires in the West. I would, I would make it. If you want to know about Scottish football, if you want to know, you know, about... How Rangers are doing financially? What you know, if you want to read really good stuff on what's the prospects for Celtic? If you want to know what chances an Indy two ref or how an Indy two ref comes about, or you know what Brexit you know means to and get really good writers, and you know, that's what I would do, and just concentrate my budget almost exclusively on those two areas, and that people say, well, if they're walking to their work and their phone and say, wonder what. Champions League makes means to sell to and they know that they're getting very good financial information mm-hmm. and inside information about it. It's all I have to subscribe to Joe Blogs for that. That's a place to go. It's interesting you say that because <clears throat> even mm-hmm. rolling twenty four hour news when the unfortunate helicopter crash and the close the mm-hmm. vaults, Twitter was five minutes ahead of BBC News twenty four. Yeah. And BBC News twenty four always start for the first hour of that story. All they would do was report what was on Twitter. Twitter. Exactly. And then what you got the next morning, of course, what did you do with it the next morning? Correct. Well, you see, when I was chief sub of the, the Herald uh, in, you know, the 70s, um, we could be pretty sure that people would be getting the first major bite of a story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even a story. Particular stories happening overnight. Yeah. For example, I mean, you know, stories from America that would happen at 1, 2, 3 in the morning. We would, we would still be on duty at that time, mm-hmm. and we would go very heavy. You know, Mar- Marvin Gaye was shot. Yeah, it's not a terrific hero story in the seventies, but I knew enough about it to say, listen, this is a this is a major talent, and we will have that first mm-hmm. in the morning. Now you would be old hat. You would have to have some like fifty greatest Marvin Gaye hits or the ten greatest. Uh, Pop stars to die young, you know. You have to rip off it now. You have to mm-hmm. do something with it. But those days, news was pretty pure. We just put news in the paper. And, and interesting, you say that because I, I sometimes think when when the papers try to run a story, 
if a story happened at five o'clock, six o'clock at night, mm. I'll have read it when it broke on Twitter. Then by seven, eight o'clock at night, you're starting to read it online on things like the BBC's website. So then you're watching it on the BBC News or whatever, Sky News, or whatever, at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So see by the time you get a paper the next morning, it feels like a story that's a year old. Yeah. Because you've read it so many times. And also, in the interim between that story has been written and published, you've had 10 hours of development so the paper can't catch up on. Can't catch up on web. The news yeah. web can catch up on. But you could have story, you know, 14 shot in America or something like that. By the time you're reading your paper next morning, it could actually be 21 shot and you would know who the shooter was. Yeah. And it's not um ISIS thing, it's actually a disaffected white yeah. supremacist or something. So you would 10 hours of... Whereas if you see if, if it's the things that have most, had the most impassioned debate amongst the man in the club mm-hmm. omnibus of Scotland... Mm-hmm in the last two years, particularly, have been politics and football. The uh, last four or five years, politics and football. And if you got into the depth of that... Yeah, I mean, the reason I mean, I'm in for the Financial Times, for example, is that in, in, in my... I mean, it's got a very good art section. I've always been interested in reading in, in the arts, and it's fantastic. But on a Saturday, I've got into, you know, financial matters in a big way, the way the world works and breaks and things like that. Now, you're reading the best people in journalism on that so why wouldn't you want to read that why would you if you if I have, for example if I'm saying there's been a big Brexit story today for yeah. example I'll read the FT tomorrow I'll buy an FT tomorrow mm-hmm. and read what their commentators say about that because I want to know the precise significance of this I know I've got an idea of them I want to know what their nuance of that is now if you're serving up people that in a Scottish environment where you've got a very vibrant Scottish football culture and you can report on, you know, just what do Rangers financial figures mean? Mm-hmm. What do they mean? Um, uh, not what headline figures are. What is behind this? And you sit down, you get a really good guy for Rangers to go through it. And then again, on the Article 50 thing today, if you go got a constitutional lawyer and you go and interview him and say, what is Article 50 decision? If you put that up as a flasher on your phone, you know, whatever you call your your paper, say the Herald is a pleasure. What Article 15 means for India F2, or Article 50, sorry, means mm-hmm. for India F2, a constitutional lawyer writes. People will read that, they will. You'll have a niche of people who read it. People are not going to be falling off the bus to read it, but you will be addressing a niche, you'll be addressing a, an area. It's interesting you use the Rangers figures there as an example because a couple of mates, a couple of guys who do stuff on their site are accountants, mm. and they always say the devil's in the detail. Aye. And And they will send me a t- they will send me the initial text when the you know so when the Rangers figures came out I was actually driving down to Stranach and got a text and saying Rangers figures are out in half an hour one of the mm-hmm. guys who's an accountant 15 minutes after the figures were out he said headline figure is the basket case mm-hmm. it was three years later before he then gave me a more detailed mm-hmm. text of you know, I'm a businessman but mm-hmm. I'll leave the detail for people to tell me he gave me a, a detailed text as to actually getting under it. And I was driving down, uh, Sports Sound was on, and the two, interestingly, actually, the two, the two stories that broke 15 minutes before Sports Sound came on air on Friday night, Kieran Tierney's out mm-hmm. and the Rangers figures. And they didn't cover either of them. Tierney, I'm surprised they didn't cover, but the Rangers figures one actually don't lend themselves to having 15 minutes to look at them and then just a superficial mm-hmm. coverage. Well, I mean, you, the great thing is the devil in the detail, as you say, the, as well, because what the headline stuff with the papers went, when most of the papers went with, was, um, you know, losses half, turnover up. But well, the real story was at the back of the book where, you know, directors going to have to put in three million to see the season in. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a feel for the guys who are doing that because they've got to do it very, very quickly and, and, and get it out. Um, you know, whereas if you can peruse it at leisure and, and then you can look at it and go, oh, that's interesting. You need that amount of money to get to the end of the season. Uh, uh, so, but that's the same. I mean, we're making a point of Rangers I and mean, any club's figures. Yeah. You've really got to look at this. Like a chancellor's statement. You, you've got to look at yeah. Sometimes we've got to look at what they don't say as we went back to yeah. earlier. You know, um, but... Uh, 
but that consumption, that immediate consumption of things, uh, you know, always lends that thing to having a period of reflection and having a real expert do it because uh, experts on, I mean, I've been through financial figures all my life and various journalistic things, but I would never say I was an expert on Whereas if I gave some to a business editor on the Herald, he'd pick up, you know, well, that's interesting mm-hmm. and immediately. The way I would pick up, you'd pick a team sheet in front yeah. of me and tell that. But if, you, if Andy Murray did something, I'd be like, well, that's not what you usually That's interesting. Murray never does that because you've got that hinterland yeah. of knowing. So, um, final thing, how do you think things panning out this season in Scottish football? League positions, league Celtic, Celtic, Celtic in particular, but obviously, but league positions of everybody. How do you see things panning through? I've, I've never seen a Celtic team for a long while so dominant. Um, I've never, you, from the Hearts game onwards, Hearts are a tough game for for it to start in. And from then on, there's an expectation now that Celtic will win games. There's mm-hmm. not the... Under Ronnie, there was always, you know, we just struggle to another each or, you know, whatever. There's just... I think there's clear blue water. I think everybody talks about Dumbelli and that. I think the biggest buy for me and the most significant player at Celtic is Scott Sinclair. He's just changed completely the way Celtic play. Mm-hmm. He's brought peace up front. He's clever. He makes intelligent runs and he's just changed the dynamic of the team. So I think Celtic, there's no reason why Celtic shouldn't win a treble. Uh, the thing about Cops is everybody can have a bad day. Yeah. And great Celtic teams, great, great Celtic teams have had bad days. Some pathetic. Nah, exactly. And, 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 and so you can have a bad day in the Cop now. So the league's a definite, but the treble's not out of it. The rest of the league is hugely competitive. I mean, from second to bottom, there's 10 points. Mm-hmm. Second to bottom is 10 points. So it, if you're asking uh, who should finish second, Rangers must finish second. And they must finish second for a couple of reasons. major one being the budget. If you grump on about Celtic having a, you know, five times your budget and all this, and that, you've got to, if you've got the second business, biggest budget, you've got to finish second. Mm-hmm. You've also got to finish second to have any hope of real hope of, of, of a peak at European football and the figures mm-hmm. are based on having some their projections yeah. are based on having some so Rangers should finish second and despite a lot of people say you know I mean, they're not a top six team and all that I think they can finish second uh, I think they probably will finish second I think so yeah I think they might I think uh, it all depends. The, the big testing point comes from them uh, later this month when they've got three mm-hmm. games, two against Hearts, one against Aberdeen. But if we go back, Brian, to the, 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 the rule of thumb that we declared in all football, the budgets declare success, yeah. it's going to be a big questions if you don't finish in. Mm-hmm. Uh, how does that pan out? Well, it pans out the way that all of those things pan out. You change the regime. Yeah. Uh, but um, but it'll be interesting. But the, the league's over done. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just how far? I mean, I think if you look back and see a mediocre Celtic team won the league by fifteen points. This is a much better Celtic team with a much better manager, mm-hmm. and the other teams haven't improved. Yeah. So it'll be over Christmas. Well, it's, I mean, arithmetically, of course, it can't be over until it's, it's over. But, I mean, I think, in all intents and purposes, it's over now. No, I, I, I believe that we were going to easily win the league anyway. But the results run of the, the last, last week, of the last week, week so. that was the, the league's done. done. Yeah. Um, and do you think Celtic can transform things to be competing in European football last 16 level in the next couple of years as Brendan's talking about I, I, sorry to, to make two questions in one the other thing that I was really heartened with was Brendan's phraseology of I want us to play with a personality mm-hmm. that people to say that's the personality of this Celtic team well good managers do that I mean that's what managers impose because in the it's become I'm always phrased that's a Van Hal team, that's a Mourinho team, that's a Klopp team, and press is like a Klopp team, that's a Pochettino team, and, you know, and you can see that's a Rodgers team. The whole thing is crucial to it is retention. Mm-hmm. How serious 
Celtic are about retaining players, how they have worked out their business plan. If they retain players, then they would, they would obviously add to the squad. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, that team, they won two points in a Champions League group with a young, unformed side with a couple of players in it who are not Champions League players. Mm-hmm. So if they retain, these players grow and they add a bit to it. Um, I mean, I gave you a couple of midfield players and you're, you're, you're running, but... Um, I agree they could, they could put the again get into the last 16 but the, the difficulty is the retention and that'll be down to two factors how serious Dermot is and how see and, and what happens in the global football world there might be a chance that other revenue streams open up other opportunities open up and what you've got to remember about Celtic is it's visible you just have to walk up to the club you just have to sit in a Champions League client and say this is a Champions League club. This has the infrastructure for this. Mm-hmm. This is the support for this. The only thing it doesn't have is the sodden TV revenues. Yeah. And that's it. So if you get into that pool, if you get your large snout into that trough, even to a limited extent, that changes the game completely. Okay, on that positive, I will say, Hugh, thanks very much. Thank you. the original Jersey player. On Sunday, October the 23rd, 2016, Celtic's hunt for their 100th major honour edged forward with a 1-0 League Cup semi-final triumph over Rangers. The narrow margin of victory flattered the fledgling Ibrox club. Celtic's superiority had been emphatic. And the heart of his dominance was a pulsating performance from Scott Brown. Under the guidance of Brendan Rodgers, the Celtic captain has recaptured and refined the attributes which originally made him such a standout performer in the Scottish game. Tenacity, endless energy and an unflinching commitment to the cause are trademarks of Brown at his best. Coupled with an unrivaled ability to niggle and wind up opponents, these qualities have helped Brown earn the adoration of the Celtic support. They have, however, also earned him the ire and the scorn of opponents and rival supporters. In an age of millionaire journeymen and buy-to-sell projects, Brown is a rare Jersey player. He seems a fitting candidate to lead Celtic to a century of major honours. Not least because these throwback qualities echo those of a much earlier Celtic hero. A man who also made the switch to Parkhead from Hibernian, a man who helped the club to their very first major honour. A man described as Celtic's very first jersey player. That man, Patrick Gallagher. Born in Renfrewshire in April 1865, Paddy Gallagher's formative footballing years were spent at hometown club Johnston before moving on to Cowlairs. He would head east and join Hibernian in 1886. The club founded by Edinburgh's Irish community would claim their first Scottish Cup in February 1887, and six months later defeated English Cup holders Preston North End 2-1 in a match billed as a World Championship. These achievements were a source of considerable pride for the Irish throughout Scotland, and in Glasgow would inspire a foundation in November 1887, Celtic Football Club. On May 8, 1888, Paddy Gallagher was part of a Hibernian side which faced Calais in a challenge match to mark the opening of the original Celtic Park. This committed halfback caught the eye of the watching Celtic officials and, along with several of his teammates, was tempted back west to sign for the ambitious new club. On August the 1st, Paddy made his Celtic debut in front of a crowd of 4,000 as the boys drew 1-1 with Abercorn in a Glasgow Exhibition Cup match on Calvin's side. His competitive debut came a month later when the Celts thrashed Shettleston 5-1 in a Scottish Cup tie. Celtic had quickly attracted a sizeable and fervent fan base and in the performances of Gallagher, the support recognised a passion and commitment to match their own. Although not the most physically imposing of players, Paddy Gallagher played football with a bold tenacity 
It's all bloody performances, evidence to fearless disregard for reputation or size. Bellow out Tom Maley was provoked to comment that Gallagher possessed pluck and grit men twice as sized in Kerry. While such wholehearted displays had made Paddy a darling of the South to support, to the fans of rival clubs, he was frequently singled out for hostility and abuse. Perhaps not surprisingly, given the nature of his departure, he was particularly unpopular among the Hibernian support. When Celtic travelled to Easter Road in October 1888, the team was showered with verbal abuse from the home fans. As the game progressed, that abuse threatened to turn physical, and on numerous occasions, supporters forced their way onto the playing field. Each time, the prime target was Paddy Gallagher. With each invasion, Gallagher stood his ground, while press reports of the game tell how after the final incursion, his once white shirt now resembled the colour of Mother Earth. The game would be halted prematurely with Celtic 3 0 victors. Because Paddy wasn't always the innocent party, and opponents would often discover his tongue and temper could be as fearsome as his play. In January 1889, a large crowd flocked to Celtic Park to see the Celts take on the famous Corinthians. The charity game was due to be followed by a return clash in London. However, with Celtic leading 4 1 at half time, an enraged Corinthian secretary threatened to cancel the return fixture. He told Tom Maley there would be no rematch if that Gallagher doesn't mend his ways and improve his language. During Easter of that year, Paddy was part of a Celtic side that travelled south to take on Bolton Wanderers. He suffered a bad cut, but fearing he might jeopardise his place in the team to Willie Maley, he played on with blood seeping from his sock. The highlight of Paddy Gallagher's career would come in his penultimate year as a player, when, on April 9th, 1892, Celtic finally got their hands on the Scottish Cup with a resounding 5-1 triumph over Queen's Park. We call it a magnificent performance, Willie Maley would say. Our lot stamped themselves that day as the champions of Scotland, without a doubt. And their football was delightful to watch. Gallagher would retire as a player the following year. He had made 45 appearances as a Celt and scored one goal. But perhaps the best measure of his commitment to the club was the thousands of hearts he won on the slopes of Celtic Park. His dedication to the Celtic cause would not end on the pitch. He became a club umpire and would serve as a committee member between 1893 and 1897. In December 1897, Paddy took ill from inflammation. Typically, he would fight on, but his life was tragically cut short by illness and he died in 1899, aged just 34. As a player, committee member and umpire, Patrick Gallagher was a devoted servant of Celtic. On the pitch, he set the benchmark for commitment to the cause. At noon on Saturday, November 5th, the hoop support can repay that commitment and the Celtic Grave Society host a memorial ceremony in honour of Paddy. The tribute will be held in Glasgow St. Kentigan Cemetery. All Celtic fans are welcome to attend and to pay their respects to the original Bold Bold Soap.